Thank you very much. Um, as you might expect, I'm going to give you a geological um, uh, perspective on this, and I will follow in with some of the things that Vim said about uh, CCS. I've got a lot to say, so I'll try and say it without confusing you. This photograph here, you're probably thinking, why have I shown you a picture of a, 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 a sort of a suburban street? It happens to be in Blackpool, uh, which um, is quite interesting for this uh, discussion because what it shows is a big crack that goes just underneath my name there. And that crack was very famous in Blackpool for a short time because it purportedly appeared after an earthquake which was related to fracking rather nearby. That is fracking for shale gas, hydraulic fracturing. And uh, people said that the frack had appeared, the crack had appeared in the bridge, and people also said that the motorbikes had fallen over and that, and that traffic lights stopped working and things like that. And uh, a lot of people said, um, yes, the crack appeared and uh, it was for, caused by the fracking. Now, the BGS detected this earthquake, and our view was there's no way that the energy of the earthquake could have caused that crack. And, and in fact, if you read the article which was attached to this photograph, if you got right down to the bottom, it said, uh, an old uh, Blackpool man said, in fact, that crack has been there since 1972. <laughs> so, um, but this, this characterizes the argument of shale gas, that there's an awful lot of stuff going on which you can't tell is true or false. And this, it's rather got worse, unfortunately. Uh, this is again Blackpool. Um, and Blackpool, and that, uh, there are people saying on websites that Blackpool, uh, the coast of Blackpool is at risk of sinking below sea level and our sea, uh, sea defenses will have to be rebuilt. Essentially, th there is no foundation whatsoever to this. Uh, it, it simply won't happen. It, it's ridiculous. Um, and unfortunately, this sort of debate is getting wider and wider and uh, the public are getting fired up with things which are, 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 are not, not true, which are scientifically uh, without foundation. So th this is going to be a little bit of... Uh, of the spirit of my talk, which is the importance of a proper debate, a reasoned and, and, a, and, a, and a mature debate, so that we can make good policy, so that we can make good decisions, because at the moment, I don't think we can. So to a bit of science, I'm sorry to show you a graph so early, but this is a famous graph from um, Pakala and Sokolow's science paper from 2004. Many of you will have seen this. It's a very clever paper. Some people don't like it now, but at the time it was very good. Because what they did was they took the business as usual, which is the ruinous high uh, CO2 emissions rate, which might uh, end us up with a very high temperature rise. And they also drew a graph of the uh, 500 parts per million stabilization level. So in other words, uh, a level of how emissions might increase in the future and how uh, they might be stabilized to develop only a 500 parts per million, which would be safe. And then they divided that triangle up, which they called the stabilization triangle, into a series of wedges, which they called stabilization wedges. And these wedges are a bit like uh, a scientific unit of climate abatement, if you like. And what you would do is you take one off, and if you do that, then your problem gets less. If you take two off, then you're getting nearer to your, um, to your um, ideal level. So what is a wedge? Well, a wedge would be uh, doubling global nuclear power. A wedge would be uh, converting 2 billion cars from 30 miles per gallon to 60 miles per gallon. So uh, 2 billion smart cars instead of 2 billion Lamborghinis. Um, another one is uh, CCS on 800 power stations. And another one is gas. And you've got to give them credit for this because they recognized the value of gas in 2004. They said, if you replace a substantial number of gas power stations, sorry, coal power stations with gas power stations, in fact, 1,500 gigawatts worth of 50% efficient coal power stations, you will get a wedge. So uh, also in 2004, along came shale gas in the United States. And this picture from Nature nicely shows it. You can see about 2004, 2005, that's when fracking really took off and horizontal drilling. And look where shale gas might be in the future. In 2035, it might be producing half of America's domestic gas. An extraordinary, uh, extraordinary projection. What does the industry think about this? Well, this nice appearance of shale gas, the, 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 the tantalizing op possibility of a wedge being offered by it. Well, uh, this is from Malcolm Bridget at Shell, who uh, I spoke alongside at a Royal Society talk a couple of months ago, who said, 
Well, displacing coal-fired power and natural gas is the fattest, fastest and cheapest way to reduce CO2 in the global power sector. It didn't really go into whether it was with CCS or not. It didn't go into whether it was a bridge to renewables or a backbone, as Vim said. So in other words, we take shale gas for a while, and then when renewables are up to power, then we, we dump the shale gas. But it wasn't quite clear. So it's not quite sure, clear you know, where we are on that. Of course, carbon capture and storage is incredibly important because without it, it's going to be very difficult to use fossil fuels at all. So let's look at some figures. Now, uh, lamentably, there are very few figures about whether shale gas or natural gas is truly more green than other kinds of gas or other kinds of energy. The modeling and the work, the studies haven't been done in sufficient detail. There is something that was published by the European Commission about a month ago, which was about shale gas in relation to other energy types. And what they said was in Poland, if you change, in Poland is extremely dependent, it's extremely dependent for its electricity on coal, something like 90% of its electricity is generated from coal. If Poland converted overnight to shale gas power stations, which you probably would like to do, it would cut its emissions by 41 to 49%, which is a very large cut. So Poland would immediately become a lot greener. But what about the world? Well, essentially, if we take the high gas scenario of the IEA from the golden rules, of, uh, golden rules for a golden age of gas, um, it, it doesn't add up because they say that if you did the high gas use scenario, you'd get 3.5 degrees C percent warming, which is highly dangerous. But of course, gas could be part of a wedge. It doesn't have to be a, a series of wedges. It could be one wedge. But there is a problem, and this is where I'm going to make my pitch to you. There's a real problem with these wedges. I said that there are several wedges that have been described. One, shale gas. Two, nuclear, double glue uh, double global nuclear power, three, 800 uh, CCS operations on 800 power stations. Unfortunately, the public won't have it because all those three things, nuclear, uh, shale gas, and CCS, all of them have the same problem, the same lack of belief amongst the public, and that might feed through to policymakers and investors as well, they worry about it. The earth is scary. People are frightened of earthquakes. Look at this. A Somerset expert reckons that if you do shale gas in the Mendips, it will turn into a volcano. And people believe it. You know, they, people believe it. And, and this is the quality of the debate that's out there. You know, I'm not saying that shale gas is the answer. I'm not saying that CCS is. I'm not saying that double global nuclear power either is. And, um, but it's, it's a problem because if you... If you want to do these things, they're all geological. And the public, you know, have many, many questions about the, the feasibility and the safety of it. So what am I arguing for? You're well, arguing it in one minute. Yes, naively, I am arguing that science needs to take a stronger role in this, particularly independent science, to assess the risk and to do it publicly and transparently and openly and to talk about what's low risk, things we don't have to worry about, like volcanoes and Blackpool disappearing under the, the Irish Sea. High risk things, and there are high risk things. There are things that we should worry about, you know, like um, methane getting into water supplies, for example. These are things we should think about. And, but the trouble is the debate is we're veering over to these ridiculous things and we get distracted and, you know, what matters is the difference between these two things. If we did that, we might get a better quality debate we might actually get better policy as well. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. We do have your number when there is a volcano in the Mendips and we'll uh, all be on the line. Uh, let's have some questions. Do we have some questions here? I've got a lady at the front already keen to get in. Please Thanks. introduce yourself. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, Jenny Banks from WWF UK. Um, I was actually going to ask a question quite similar to Professor, Professor Eakin's point about uh, not building any more coal, but um, in, in light of the fact that's already been asked, um, just, just a point really about global fossil fuel reserves. Um, if, if you look at global conventional known reserves, about 80% of them can't actually be, be effectively burnt or used if we want to stay within two degrees of warming. Um, and that's without looking at unconventionals. Um, and then if you look at the US, uh, the, cl the claim is that, that um, emissions have fallen because of shale gas. 
And that, that might be the case, but actually the coal is, is, production is the same, it's just going elsewhere. So isn't this actually about keeping the stuff in the ground? Do you want to take that one first? Um, keeping the stuff in the ground. Well, I, I think all I'm saying is that, you know, I'm not advocating any of these things. I'm simply saying that if you want to do them, uh, you, you're going to have to communicate the science better and, and the risks, you know, to the public better. Otherwise, we're not going to have these wedges. Uh, I'm, I'm not advocating shale gas or nuclear or anything else. I'm a public, public servant, so I don't do that sort of thing. I'm simply here to explain what I think is the, is the issue. And the main issue is if you want to have, uh, you know, fossil fuels or nuclear, you know, or, or shale gas, well, you're going to have to be able to address these issues. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. But it does sound odd for you to say, you know, though you're, of course, a public servant, that yeah. if you want any of them... I mean, you, you must have a view on some sort of preference or some sort of risk that attaches to one and not to another. Yeah, I mean, there are, as I said, there are risks, for example, to do with earthquakes in fracking, in, 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 yeah. in shale gas. And, you know, and there, are, there is science that we can do to mitigate those risks. There are, there's science that we can do that, to develop a pre procedure whereby a company that might frack um, can, can be slowed down. There could be a traffic light system whereby if they get to an earthquake of a certain size, they can be told to stop fracking. That, that's the appliance of science, if you like, to use a, a term, it's an advertising term, you know, that, um, that shows how you can do this. But um, you have to do the work, in other words, in order to you know, distinguish low risk from high risk. Yep. Anyway, let's take some more questions. Question. We've got one over here and the gentleman in the blue jumper. I'll try and take uh, this gentleman at the front next. So we might take these two together if you do. Hello, Hello I'm Mike. Robert Page. I'm studying geology at Imperial. And possibly if people like the WWF, Greenpeace, the BBC and the Guardian didn't fill the public's imagination with such scaremongering, there might be a chance for the proper science to have an independent look and actually possibly if we stop bashing the energy companies con the whole time, might be discovered that the wind farms they dream of don't actually solve any energy problems and possibly don't help our CO2 either. So you obsess with bringing down CO2, but maybe the way to do that is through gas. And then we both have an energy supply which we can rely on and we help the environment. And that's okay. a BBC tell. Uh, and, and yes, sir, at the front. Thank you. Uh, Tony Curzon Price from Open Democracy and Intelligence Squared. Um, I'm interested to know, Mike, whether you think that there's a, uh, is there a science to the perception of risk? I'm quite struck by the fact that in the US, somehow or other, it seems as if these perceptions of risk have uh, gone a different way. Mm. Might that be linked to different interests that people have? I mean, after all, in the US, if you own a piece of land, then you own the geology underneath it. Yes. Does, does the perception of risk depend on our institutions in that sort of way? Yeah, of, of course, and you hit on it quite rightly that um, you know, in the United States, if you have shale gas under your farm or your house, then you stand to gain from it directly. In Britain, you don't. So that changes the argument quite a bit. And there is a, an extremely well-developed science of risk, and you can be sure that we're working on this. And you know, British regulators take on the science of risk, you know, very fully and very rigorously. Um, but, uh, you know, we've seen this already. We, we know that we have amongst the, the, the best and tightest regulations for offshore gas, uh, offshore oil and gas in, in, in the world. And, you know, generally the North Sea has been extremely successful uh, in, in, in doing that, in, in, in regulating properly and making sure it's safe with a few unfortunate, you know, uh, exceptions. But the people of Blackpool don't, don't take that, you know, they, they don't want that. And, and again, I'm not, uh, I don't want to be seen as somebody who's pushing fossil fuels at all. I'm saying that, you know, if you want to have them, then the science has to be properly communica communicated. And just going to the gentleman's com comment, I don't agree with what you're saying about Greenpeace and, you know, World Wildlife Fund, because these are all people who contribute to the debate and who make us think, you know, beyond, you know, if we are a fossil fuel um, company, whatever, you, you think beyond that. And it's important to have all those stakeholders in the argument and in the discussion. So, um, and, and they often put over the science very well. I mean, occasionally, you know, it might be over, overwrought and, 
But this stuff about you know, Mendip's volcanoes isn't coming from World Wildlife Fund or Greenpeace. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> For, I mean, I think that your, your point is made, sir. So, uh, shall we move on to...